I've been a blacksmith armorer for over 30 years. I've created weapons for over 200 feature films. This is Man at Arms. You know, the anime weapons are always my favorites, and I know the fans have been requesting this forever. This is Elucidator from Sword Art Online. I patterned out on paper, just freehand sketched Elucidator's blade and transferred that with a carbide scribe to the 1075 spring steel and then took that to the bandsaw. And Brian cut it out with a bimetal cutting blade that cuts through that hard steel. I in turn took it to the belt grinder, ground the profiles to the right proportions. Took a soapstone marker and marked where the internal cutout would be and uh, again had Brian take that to the plasma cutter and cut out that inner piercing on it. There's another piece that overlays on the hilt section that will be cut out of 3 8 of an inch thick uh, mild steel, low carbon steel. have Glenn drill the holes here on this. The edges will be beveled and that in turn will be polished up. And then this will be cut to fit with a Dynafile. I had to extend the tang that will go through the handle, so I took a piece of 3 quarter inch hot rolled steel round bar stock and forged it out so it was about an inch wide by about 6 or 7 inches long. That'll be TIG welded onto the 1075 steel blade. The end of the tang will be threaded to a 3816, just a standard thread size that I use. I have Brian on the lathe turning down a piece of pre-machining steel. It's a 12L14 steel. The L designates that it's a leaded alloy. It's a lower carbon steel, so it, uh, it works pretty easily. He will turn a pommel about three inches long, one inch in diameter to match the Delrin grip, which is about nine inches long. Alicia was cutting out some 50 thousandths thick nickel silver sheet using a jeweler's piercing saw. We will be riveting that onto the blade after we heat treat the temper. I heat treated the lucidator, quenched it in oil. That uh, brought the sword blade to a very hard, brittle condition and we put it into the electric heat treating oven at about 600 degrees and left it in there for six hours, which allowed the blade to relax a little bit, which is called tempering. At that point, when the blade was true and nice and flat, I brought it over to the homemade belt grinder I made when I was 17, using a soft contact wheel and progressing from a 320 grit uh, aluminum oxide belt down to a 600 grit belt, polishing the flats of the blade. When that was done, we took it over to uh, what I call the Wheel of Death. It's a high-speed buffing machine. We polished up the flats of the blade and the hilt and pommel, and then we sent that off to an outside processing company that did a black oxidizing finish, which is like a black rust that penetrates the surface of the metal. When that came back from the oxidizer, I took a small angle grinder with a 120 grit disc and sanded down the finish for the bevels. That'll be polished up bright. Applied the nickel silver emblem on the front of the blade, also with rivets. Sharpened the thing up to a razor sharpness. From what I understand, the sword has been recreated by master bladesmiths in Japan for display in a museum. I feel very honored that the fans in the US and worldwide have specified that they want me to make this, so I built this for you. who is one of the actors on the Nickelodeon TV show iCarly, came in and sliced up some fruit really well.
スカノール様だ。<笑><笑>はい。To make all the bladed portions of the axe, I'm going to use tool steel 1045 that comes in round stock. I will first form the main blade of the axe and then take the same tool steel and make the two spearheads which will turn into the spikes at the top and at the side. Now that Ilya has the material drawn out to shape, it's time to begin introducing the bevels to the material. I'm going to be helping Ilya by holding one end of it as he uses two tongs to guide the material underneath the power hammer. The bevels of the axe now pulled out. It's time to move on to some handwork so we can establish the curve that we need in this axe blade. As we lay the curve into the blade, some of the material on the edge is going to get a little distorted. So we'll then turn the edge on its side back onto the flat of the anvil and true it up as we go. Okay, now that we have our crescent shaped axe blade forged, the next step is to true up the perimeter. You can see each individual hammer blow kind of made little bumps along the edge. So I'm going to get that completely trued up. Now I don't want to take too much material off the actual face of the axe. The reason being, after I get the perimeter trued up, we're going to be able to see where that edge wanders a little bit, straighten it up, get that nice and true along the whole surface, and then we'll move on to actually grinding the edge. To start forging our back and top spike, Ilya has to first create a preform. This is turning the round stock into a tapered spike. With the material now drawn out to length, Ilya uses a hot cut tool to cut them into two equal parts. 
So you've seen us draw out bars using the hit turn technique pretty often on the show, but you've never seen us do two bars at once. This really demonstrates a lot of skill, and to be honest, really is kind of showing off. So now that I've trued up the edge and gotten the alignment exactly where I need it to be, I've moved on to the surface grinding or the edge grinding of our axe. One of the major challenges with grinding or polishing a giant forging like this, it has a really rough surface. I have to make that surface look really nice and smooth. I've gone ahead and done one side. Now let's go ahead and finish out the second. Then we'll get it heat treated. And then the real challenge starts, which is polishing it after the heat treat. create the cylindrical-like middle portions of our spear points, Billy is using a swage underneath the power hammer that has the proper form to it. He's just gonna take his time, be very careful, and run it up the center of the material. After that, he can move on to drawing out the blades. All right, we have our top and our back spikes back from forging. I must say, Ilya did a divine job forging them. Now, there are several different ways we could have done this. Could have just added some round stock on a plasma cut blade. But to be honest, forging them not only makes them much stronger, but, you know, shows off some higher level of skill as well. It's now my job to go in and just clean up the perimeters and then move on to sanding the blades themselves being sure that I leave enough thickness to the blades that they heat treat nice and safely. Since there's a lot of central mass on the center of these blades, it could cause a lot of warping if I grind them too thin. Because these blades have very different thicknesses, very thick in the center and very thin on the edges, Ilya is going to be coating them with a slurry during the heat treat to play it safe. With the back and top spike now heat treated and tempered, I can move on to the final polishing to finish out our blades. All right, now we're getting ready to cut the angel wing parts for our seven deadly sins axe. We're going to cut it using our CNC plasma table out of some 316 plate steel.
Often we work fairly thin materials when we create forms like this. But since this is a structural part of this weapon, Ilya is going to have to use thicker material. That'll have to be worked hot, or it would be very difficult to get the forms he needs. On the guard for this handle, there's actually a large flange on the top and bottom of it. They could be made as one piece and then the guard set in. I'm gonna do two separate pieces because Ilya wants a hole in the guard where the handle goes through, so I'll have a top and bottom flange. But I'll turn them together so that I know that they're roughly the right shape and they pretty much match. I'm starting with a piece of three inch solid stock. It's about eight inches long, so it's very heavy. I'm gonna be cutting the outside and then putting a big hole through the inside. I'm going to cut them in half, and then I'll do a little bit of internal cut that's going to take some of the weight out, and we'll put the whole piece together. Ilya now takes his material and brings it up to heat, takes it to the nasal, draws out a spike, cuts it off, draws out the next spike, cuts that off. He's able to make all four spikes from the same piece of material, and they'll be fastened to the guard. So Ilya has forged four spikes, and where these spikes are going to attach is to our D-shaped handguard. So when your hand holds the axe, there's going to be a D-shaped guard that goes like that, and then these spikes are going to be attached all the way on the outside. So what I'm going to do now is just move to a sander, clean them up, and then we'll be able to move on and actually weld them on to our guard. All right, we have the body parts formed for our angel, both the tail and the wing section. I'm gonna be grinding in a lot of detail on the narrow wheel, but to get things started, I gotta get all my surfaces nice and clean. So I'm gonna start on an 80 grit, move progressively through the grits, and then we'll move on to doing the detail work after. for the central part of our angel, now cleaned off all the way through 220. Time to move to a narrow wheel to start adding in some detail. This is meant to mimic the robe of an angel and the folds in the gown. I'm gonna start with a narrow wheel, strike my lines, and then I'll go back to giving that more depth on the edge of a sanding wheel. Using a C-shaped forge, Ilya is gonna very carefully rotate the ax blade back and forth until he gets an even heat across the entire length of our ax. Now that he has achieved that goal, 
it's time to quench in water. All right, it's time to dish our central circles for our ax. This will be the mounting point for all of our different blades. It's where all the structure comes from. Now, a lot of times I see when people make props with circles like this, they leave them flat. But if you add a little bit of doming, it actually is much more aesthetically pleasing to the eye. So we're gonna use the screw press that utilizes the oldest form of mechanical advantage, the inclined plane, in the form of a screw. With just simple rotations of the handle like this, we're putting down massive amount of tonnage using a top die and a bottom die to create our form. So when you're trying to get a nice even dish on basically a bowl shape like this, it's best to start around the outside, work all the way around and then kind of just spiral your way into the center, creating a nice even shape. Afterwards, you can fill your flat spots and just go over different places until you get it nice and smooth. So what we have here is our knuckle bow or handguard portion of our axe. What I started with was drawing a three inch circle here that'll match the two lathe turrings that'll sandwich on either side that Carrie did and then one and a quarter inch holes that will slide over our pipe. What we have to do now is put our D shape into it. In the anime it looks pretty flat but once again if you put a little bit of curvature, a little bit of dishing in a flat piece it looks much more pleasing to the eye. So we're going to go back to the screw press, start by giving a really light dish and then do any hand forming that we have to do afterwards. With our spikes cleaned up and the knuckle bow formed, it's time to weld on our spikes to the knuckle bow. I hold them in place as John Tack welds them from the inside. Once we have all four spikes in place, John can do a final structural weld. All right guys, so at this point, we now have our spikes welded to our handguard. I went and blended all of the weld from the inside of the ax here. Now I know some of you might have your finger on the troll button right now, thinking, hey, they made every part out of steel up until this point, and obviously, most of the parts on this have to be brass. The way we're gonna go about this is we're gonna use a wire wheel with brass wire on it, heat up our parts and brass everything to the right color. The reason we chose to do that instead of making it out of brass is that this ax is massive. Brass is pretty soft and brittle sometimes. So we really needed to make sure the structure of the ax was nice and solid, so we went with steel. With all of our pieces of the angel now joined as one, we have to start creating the offset pieces that go on the sides. I've cut a series of triangles out and Ilya's just gonna bend them and form them to shape and then weld them in.
Now that the main body of the angel form has been welded up, Matt will begin to blend the welds off. We'll have to clean the entire piece and then attach the head section. solid brass wire wheel. Rick and Tanner are going to go through, heat up the parts, and then brass them. They've got pieces of steel clamped to the outside of the blade. That's going to prevent the blade itself from being annealed along the cutting edge. had to respond to the incredible number of requests we've seen. Every person in the shop had some task to perform here. But now that we've finished, we're ready to move on and create the next weapon here on Man at Arms. I've been a blacksmith armorer for over 30 years. I've created weapons for over 200 feature films. This is Man at Arms. I find it really interesting to take weapons based off of anime designs that are just humongous, unfeasible, unwieldable weapons and then try and make it real. The guys who drew this had no idea that someone would actually make this full scale. It is actually going to be manageable. You're not going to need two people to carry it around. I'm going to make this thing work. The bleach sword is going to be about 72 inches long overall. 48 inches of it will be 1 8 of an inch thick, 1075 spring steel, almost 9 inches wide. Most of the time I'll develop a paper or metal template. In this case I freehand drew the contours I wanted on the big sheet of steel. I take it over to the plasma cutter and cut out the profiles. After uh, rough cutting it on the plasma cutter I take it over to the belt finder and refine the edges. This piece I'm going to send out for commercial heat treating. They're going to use salt baths to keep it straight. If I quench something that thin and that large, it'll uh, turn into a giant taco. It just warps all over the place. I need to send it in in two pieces. When it comes back, I'll use a Heliarc or TIG welder to weld the handle, which was uh, two inches by about 20 inches long of 1018 mild steel. And then put it in my heat treating oven and tempered it 
to about a 52 Rockwell. I started grinding the edge bevels approximately two inches to three inches in using the belt grinder and a 50 grit belt. I uh, made a template for the grip that'll be going over the 1018 handle and we cut those out of 5 16 thick aluminum. I took a divider and taped a sharpie to one of the legs and used that to lay up a 3 inch line from the cutting edge and we cut that line in with an abrasive cut off disc. The cutting portion of the blade will be polished bright, the rest of the blade will be black oxidized, there will be a chemical blackening on the back of the blade. I have the 1075 steel blade with the welded on mild steel tang. I have a 5 16 of an inch thick aluminum plate coming on here. That's this shape, which is also going to hopefully bring the weight back in the hand a bit more. And then that will be wrapped with stingray skin here. This is uh, the actual pieces used in Japanese katanas, which is called a same. That'll be glued on the top of the aluminum grip then crisscrossed with leather back and forth in a uh, katana pattern. And the back end of it will have a slot in here with a silk ribbon coming off of it. The bleach sword is the second biggest sword that I've ever made. The biggest one being Buster's sword. Working in the, the tight quarters that I have is really not optimal for grinding swords of this size. As I continue making bigger weapons like this, I'm gonna need to get a bigger shot. Ever since Elucidator, you guys have been begging for another Sword Art Online build. And the comments have been pretty equal for all of them, so we chose the one we want to do the most, and that's Asuna's Rapier. I surrender! Blacksmithing. I has it. I like the best. That one. But I also like savings to propane. So when men at arms decide to make Asuna's Rapier, I jump in it. Billy is going to start the day off by beginning forging on our blade. He moves to the Nasal power hammer to start breaking the bar down. It's going to draw it out into a bar and then begin the real bladesmithing. So we want to keep the whole thickness of this blade pretty even, add a little distal taper at the end, but we have some overlays to fit onto the blade. So having it nice and even before grinding really saves us a lot of time. At this stage, it's really important to keep everything nice and straight. So Ilya moves to the anvil with the hand hammer before returning to the heat. Ilya's gonna put the handle in first, and now uses a hot cut tool to remove the handle section. This will now allow Ilya to begin forging the shoulder and then pull out the tang. Historically, rapiers are primarily thrusting weapons. This blade is a little beefier than a historical rapier, but it still needs that taper for that nice powerful thrust. It's also going to be a bit of a slasher as well. We're going to add a really nice thick bevel to the edge. Should be pretty impressive by the time we get to the demos. Okay. Now that the blade is forged to our desired shape, Ilya is now going to start hand beveling. He's going to move to our Sawyer's anvil and use a Japanese forging hammer to start this process. 
When setting up the final geometry of the blade and the hand bevel, I'm using water to blast off the scale to allow me to see all the flaws that needed to be corrected. As I'm forging, I'm angling the blade slightly so that the angle of the hit of the hammer is the same as the angle of the anvil to the blade. That allows me to have a symmetric bevel from one side to another. Now that the forging is complete, it's finally time for me to get to grinding. Before I do that, I wanted to show you guys something real quick. This is the anime rapier blade, and this is a historical rapier blade. I think you guys can tell the difference. This one is one I started last week. It's real light, it's mostly a thrusting blade. This one, it's still gonna be a thrusting blade, but it's a lot more exaggerated, much like most blades you find in animes. I'm gonna start by just refining that profile, and then move on to the edge. Phase one of grinding is now complete. I got my profile defined where I wanted, got the tip nice and true. Now I'm gonna follow those bevels that Ilya forged in, keep them nice and steep. Okay, Matt has just finished rough grinding Asuna's rapier blade here. The next step is to start figuring out the guard and the overlays. This is a similar design that we're going to go with. In order to make it work, I'm going to move the overlay a little farther forwards just in front of that cross member. So my next step is to sketch out the rough shape before I go to the AutoCAD and draw it up and cut it out. made out of W2 blade steel, which has between 0.98 and 1% carbon content. This is a very, very good proper blade steel. The downside of this is you have to watch your heat treating temperatures, because if you overheat any section of it, you increase the grain growth and ruin the blade. At this point, Ilya carefully removes the blade from the heat with a pair of tongs to make sure it doesn't bend. Places the blade into the oil nice and slow and evenly. Now let's it quench for about eight seconds. We'll then remove it, check it for straightness, move to the vise. He's got a couple seconds to work out any kinks that could be in that blade. So he gets as much out as he can, then clamps it vertically and walks away. Now that the blade is fully hardened, we have to temper it. We place the blade into a hot oil bath around 450 degrees for about an hour. Asuna's rapier appears to be straight. No need for final fixing. It's ready for Matt. All right, now that we have the blade completely heat treated and tempered and straightened, I can move on to start polishing it. I went ahead and fully ground everything before heat treating, so I don't have to take any more metal off, just enough to make it nice and pretty. So what we have to do next is we gotta start laying out the cup and the overlay for the cup. What Ilya did is he went ahead and took some thin sheet metal, formed a cup, and then we flattened it back out. So now I'm gonna trace some lines onto some paper. That'll give me my dimensions I need. Then I'll go into AutoCAD and get everything figured out. Now that we have the overlays welded to the base of the guard, Ilya can now hot form the guard to shape. He's gonna use the horn of the anvil, form it over, leave a seam, we're gonna weld that seam, and then blend it, and the base of our guard will be complete. So, we've chosen to bend the rapier guard hot over the horn of the anvil. The reason for that is, if we would have bent the base plate first, which is this cross section of a cone, and then place the overlays on top, our overlays would not have fit around it because of the radius's differences. There's a slight gap here that will be fixed cold, then the piece will be wire wheeled and given to John for final weld. So the palm 
pommel on a Suna's Rapier is very much like one of our regular production pommels. Uh, it needs to be a little bit larger, a little more elongated, not have this foot. So I'm just gonna freehand turn it on the lathe and then we'll sand it and polish it. To bend the applique for the blade, I clamp it to the tang, that way my bend replicates the geometry of the blade fairly closely, and hit it with a plastic mallet. Now that our guard is formed and welded, we just gotta do some blending and remove all of the scale off the outside rim. So Sam moves to the sander to get this done. Now that we got our cup, it's time to start adding a little shape to our crossbar that'll fit inside and tie it all to the blade. Matt uses the Bader sander to sculpt the crossbar to a much nicer form than this rough bar we start with. In a lot of the pictures and when I watch the episodes, this crossbar is a really plain piece. It's usually just a straight bar. But since this is a rapier, I figure we might as well take the opportunity and add a little fanciness to the cross piece. The last thing I have to do is just shorten the ends up just a little bit so it fits just inside this inside lip. John welds the crossbar and the cup on these pieces together. This will comprise the entire guard for this sword. All right, we're gonna move on to sanding our wood handle to shape. Chose a piece of red oak. It's already round. I'm gonna do a wasted form handle. Uh, mimics the silhouette of a woman's body. We're just gonna sand it in. Could use a lathe for this if, if you wanted to, but I wanna show you guys how we do it by hand. So I'm gonna be setting the bezels for the gemstones on here. I've got a little bit of acid flux already on the material and the bezel in place, I'm gonna heat it from behind. The flux should kinda of glue it in place. If it moves at all, before I add solder, I'll just move it a little bit by hand. With the gemstone and bezel masked off, Matt now paints the entire guard to the proper color. Working directly on the Bader sanders, Matt sculpts the land jet to form. With all of the pieces of this sword beginning to come together, it's now time to get some polishing done. This sword was a lot of fun to make. We got to do a lot of different processes. Forging, grinding, and a lot of fabrication, and even some gemstone settings. Really happy with this sword. Can't wait to see what it does in the demos.
So, you want to see my sword, huh? Remarkable craftsmanship. Dragon Ball Z is one of the most popular animes of all time. And it's certainly the most mainstream because it was on regular TV for a long time and most of us grew up watching it. Sam and I are both big fans. We've debated back and forth for about a year who was going to get to build this one. We decided, let's just share it. So let's get right to the forge. One of the nicest things about these larger hammers is that we can use large round stock. This is a far less expensive way to buy good material. In this case, 1045. on this sword, we're gonna be turning it. We've got some free machining material. It's been laying around the shop for a while, so it's a little rusty on the outside. I'm gonna put it up, take a powered pass across the surface to make it smooth and clean, and then I'm gonna disconnect the auto feed and just freehand the entire shape. Prior to beveling the edge, Sam finishes much of the form on the nasal, creating the point and then cutting in the shoulders. Even though we're going to be doing a lot of grinding on this sword, we want a little bit more width. So Sam is actually going to start the bevels with a hand hammer, and this will drive more width as the material goes to the outside. Now that Sam's finished the forging on this blade, it's time to start grinding. I just wanted to point out a few distinct features on this that differ it from a normal western sword. One is the point, not only the profile, but the grind on it will be different, and the guard has a hibaki. Uh, really let you know that you know, this was a Japanese artist that drew a western style sword. It's going to be a little bit more of a challenge, but it's going to be fun. Let's get at it. All right, so I have my edge bevels roughed in at this point. I went ahead and ground it to a diamond cross section, which is very typical on a Western sword. But like I said before, the point of everything dippers into a very Japanese style of grinding. But what I gotta do is now take that central line and make a diamond. So I'm gonna start my flat bevel from the point and push it all the way back. It's tricky and it's very technical grinding and it's gonna be a challenge. Now that the rough grinding phase is complete, Sam's gonna move on to heat treating our blade. In this case, we already had our welding forge up to temperature. It's a little shorter than our heat treating forge, but he's just gonna carefully slide that blade in and out until he gets an even heat and then quench. 
With the blade now to shape and the tang to find, Sam now knows his portions for the guard. He's going to use the excess 1045 that he cut off from the blade forging and forge that into his guard. He starts by using a tool under the power hammer to pinch some material. He'll then draw that out by hand and then forge the round ends that we need. Since Sam only rough forged this guard to shape, he's got to do a little truing on the sander. He starts on an 80 grit and works his way through. Sam's forged more 1045 blades than any of us in the shop, and he says after heat treating that these blades only need a torch temper. He uses a torch and carefully heats the central portion of the blade, which is the thickest and has the most mass. This will allow that heat to spread towards the edge, giving us a nice blue color in the center and a straw color towards the edge. I'm now ready to turn this blade into its final form. We normally polish on progressively softer wheels, but on this we want everything to be super crisp we want that bevel to really stick out and our lines to be nice and true. After marking the guard, Sam now cuts the slot using the Gorton milling machine. Watching a few episodes of some old school Dragon Ball, I noticed there was a hibaki on the other side of the guard. We're going to make this out of steel because that's what it looks like in the show. So I'm going to take two pieces of steel, I'm going to bend them over slightly in the vise to match our cross section of the blade, and then we'll weld them solid later. After the guard's been sanded through the grits, the last thing we have to do before we can assemble Let's turn those nodules down on the ends just a little bit. Sam's going to use the torch and a wood hammer and bend them on a slight angle. Alright, I got my edges completely polished all the way through the grits. I'm really happy with it. This central bevel is so sharp it could cut you but it's not even in its final form yet. We have to refine that tip and then we'll be ready to assemble. All right, we got our hibaki welded onto the blade. We welded the seams here. Not only does that give us our nice look, but it gives us nice clean shoulders for the guard to sit. So now my goal is to go to the 80 grit. I'm gonna clean the weld spots, and then I gotta make the central ridge on the hibaki match the ridge on the blade. the 
sandal core on the Z sword. I'm gonna be using some oak. Because it's gonna get wrapped in leather, I don't need to try and make it in two halves and make the seam pretty. So I'm gonna mill only one half of the wood to the dimension of the slot. Because the tang is tapered and it's really hard to mill a taper, I'm gonna mill it in a stepped hole. I'm gonna use a wide milling cutter the dimension of the tang up front. And then as I get down to this line here, I'm gonna switch out the cutters to a smaller one. It'll get super glued roughly together to be shaped, and then it'll be finely epoxied onto the tang and leather wrap I carry. After milling his tang recess in his two pieces of wood, Sam clamps them together and begins shaping them on the sander. This is a pretty simple handle. We're gonna then cover it with leather later, but it still has to have the right form and the right shape. step. This is the same kind of leather wrapping I do every day on our regular swords. I'll be able to work right through this quickly. You guys have been asking for us to do some more realistic, historical based swords for a long time. This one is not only a western sword, but has a lot of Japanese characteristics, so it was a whole lot of fun to make, had a few challenges, and I'm really happy with it.